Well, hi guys, it's that time. It's our Bible teaching snippet of the day. Well, as you can see, I am sitting inside and not outside under my uh, hickory tree. It is so windy here today. I believe that the wind is blowing in a rain uh, storm that's going to come in later. Uh, but anyway, not going to happen sitting outside today. It's beautiful. It's cool out, uh, but uh, not a good setting to try to teach because of the wind. Uh, today, what I want to do is set into part two of our little mini-series on 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And my goal in this teaching, okay, is to maybe open our minds up a little bit to understand more clearly what uh, the writer of 2 Timothy is actually just trying to say to Timothy. Uh, and Because uh, what I see is that uh, a lot of false claims are made through this verse and uh, through some misunderstanding of the way that it's been translated, okay? And many times we use this as a proof doctrine proof of doctrine, of proof scripture, uh, that every single word in every single book of the 66 book canonized Bible is 100% accurate, 100% never ever been changed by any man, uh, never been modified, nothing's been taken away or added to, uh, and that the Bible itself is 100% representing truth that's what the T-H, T-R-U-T-H, truth about God and about humanity, okay? And I'm going to propose to you that the Bible is not 100% truth, T-R-U-T-H, about God himself, although it is truly representing the thoughts and ideas of the people that was writing those things. And I also want you to maybe consider with me, as I talked a little bit yesterday, that uh, we don't have 100% accurate, unchanged, unedited uh, scriptures. We, and I said this yesterday, it's worth repeating. In 600 B.C., before Christ, okay, the uh, Old Testament, if you want to call it that, and the other many t scrolls that they used, uh, that have been taken out of what we would call the Bible and set aside, went through a major revision in 600 B.C. Okay, And then uh, 150 years prior to Christ, that's uh, 150 B.C. again, it went through yet another uh, correction and change. And a lot of what this was is that uh, some of the Greek philosophy, some of the belief in pagan gods got integrated into the Hebrew scriptures so that the Greek-speaking people could relate to those scriptures as well, okay? And I use the example of Hades. The, the word that was always used uh, for the grave or for the uh, place of the dead, the unseen, was the word Sheol, okay? But as uh, the Greeks believed in these underworld gods and all of these different gods, okay, uh, the word Hades got stuck in there to represent where people went in the afterlife. So then we go forward to 400, or actually the 4th century, 325 AD. Uh, this is after Christ, uh, the Roman Empire, Yes, uh, Emperor Constantine and the Church of Rome yet again did what they called corrected scripture. And what they were trying to do, okay, is to make all of it fit together to fit what they believed the Christian narrative should be, okay? Now, you can go and check behind me. That's okay. Uh, and I want you to. Here's what I want also for you to realize, too. These are only three that I'm mentioning. We don't know for sure 100%. Uh, I believe that some scriptures were changed along the way. These were major uh, changes, major, major uh, uh, editing uh, done. But, but along the way, I mean, we've got uh, the verses in Jeremiah 8, 8, where it clearly, and I hate, I don't like using the word clearly, but where it says right there, the prophet says that the scriptures were changed by the scribes. 
Okay, so I want to uh, show you one more thing because I want to back up what I said yesterday. This is in the book Raising Hell, okay? And she did an absolute wonderful job in her research, okay? And yes, when I read books, I always go behind those people who are writing it and go, okay, click, click, click. Yes, they're telling the truth. But this is on page 15 right here. You see that? I've got it highlighted, and I'm going to read this to you because I think it's very important that I prove to you uh, what I told you yesterday about uh, the, the Jews and the he Hebrew-speaking people, if you want to call it that. They never made the claim, never made the claim about their own holy writings that they were intact, never been changed. God had this supernatural, mystical power over man's free will to change things. But for somehow that these scriptures were never changed. May I, before I read this to you, throw in also, it's not widely known, but scholars do know this. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found out at uh, the Qumran, okay? Uh, and some, some people call it Qumran, okay? And I've been there three times, by the way, in Israel. These Dead Sea Scrolls that were sealed and hid away, buried in caves, okay, that's never been touched, never been changed or edited, absolutely contradict some of the things that's in our 66 book Bibles, okay? So that proves some things have been changed. There are other ancient manuscripts that are found that don't say exactly the same thing that our Bibles do, okay? Uh, I could go on and on about this. Okay, let me talk to you about Marcion. He's known for the very first uh, Bible that was ever put together, and I need to thank my friend Joe for bringing that to my attention. I'm always learning from other people as well. I do not ever claim to know everything. In fact, I think if we come together in a good discussion, uh, we all can learn from one another. So he sends me the information. In 144 A.D., Marcion puts together the first ever what you want to call New Testament canon. He had uh, a very short unedited, unadded into version of the Gospel of Luke and 10 letters that was believed to have been written by Paul. So, uh, with enough of that though, okay, so I just want to let you know that even Marcion's scriptures that he had back in 144 AD does not match the scriptures that we have of those exact same 11 books, okay? Let me read to you from uh, Julia's research. Quoting from the 70 Faces of Torah, the Jewish way of reading the sacred scriptures. And this is the quote from this writing. Even if the Torah contains fairly accurate historical memories, it is likely these memories were reworked and retold to fit the needs of later times. Did you get that? Okay, so with that said, I'm going to try to add just a little bit more to this, so I'm going to go a couple, two more minutes maybe, and talk to you a little bit. So yesterday I read to you what uh, 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 actually says in the literal Greek, okay? And it doesn't say that all scripture is and was inspired or breathed by God. Actually, that word is is, has been added. I'm going to show you this, okay? This is from a literal rendering of that great scripture. Did you notice that the word is, I've underlined it in red for you, uh, is in italics. So what that means is the translators added that word to the scripture, so or to the uh, writing here. So let me read it to you in the, the Greek, right here out of the literal New Testament rendering. Uh, it says, all scripture breathed by God, all scripture God breathed is a better way, is what I'm reading here. Uh, all scripture breathed by God. And look down here at the footnotes. See the footnotes? It says here, every... And then down on the other footnote, it says, that is God inspired. So let me read it to you with what this rendering sh can show. Every scripture that is God inspired is profitable for teaching, 
rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And and I and that and that is a, a fairly accurate uh, rendering of that. But I like to uh, actually uh, say that instead of making it sound so harsh, uh, it is good to use for teaching and instructing people, for uh, showing them how they need to live, okay? I've got a rendering of that. Let me see this. I really like that rendering that I had pulled up yesterday. Um, let's see. This is it right here, and I want to close with this, okay? Uh, the literal Greek is simply making the statement that any writing inspired by God was, is, and will be useful for teaching, for helping people, and for correcting them and showing them how to live. Now, doesn't that just make a lot more sense than for it to be something that we're trying to pound and make uh, true? Uh, I tell you what, I did write this down, so I'm going to say this real quick. It's like, and I'm, going, I'm just trying to give you an example so you can understand the difference in the... Uh, how it changes the meaning when we add just one little word like is. All scripture is inspired by God rather than scripture that is inspired by God. Let me show you this. So I'm going to use uh, pizza as my point. And here we go. All pizza is delivered by Frank. And it is good. Now, that sounds like that nobody else can ever deliver any pizza other than Frank. Every pizza that comes to your doorstep must always be and will never be delivered by anyone else because Frank is the guy that is the pizza delivery guy. Okay, let's do it a different way. All pizza made by, that actually was made and delivered by Frank is good. So what it's saying here, okay, and I'm hoping I'm bringing this together. Uh, not all pizza delivered to your doorstep may be good. <laughs> There's other people making and delivering pizza, which may not be good. It's got their fingerprints on it, and they're, they, they don't cook very good. Uh, but versus the fact that if Frank made the pizza, the pizza will always be good, okay? I, I pray that that uh, helped you make a little bit of sense of what I'm trying to mine out here. I'm going to keep digging a little deeper, though, okay? But before I hang up on you, uh, please, uh, please feel free to write me little comments. Ask questions. Share your thoughts with me. Bring out details that you have maybe learned already in some of your studies on the things that I'm teaching, as well as before I close and hang up. I want to tell you I love you and I want to thank you uh, for spending your time with me today. I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.